Hey everybody, welcome to episode 99 of the Ask Staff Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about unplugging sensors to diagnose a problem and how to get better traction. Okay, so before we get into the questions, I just wanna mention that on next episode, episode 100, we are going to be doing a giveaway on that video. So uh, it's not going to be something we're gonna announce the winners in that video. We're actually going to be uh, talking about the details of what is required to be eligible for the giveaway in that video. But I just wanted to mention it just for anybody who may see this one and may have not seen that one in the future. So make sure you look out for episode 100 because we will be doing a giveaway for our fans. Uh, and so be sure to check that episode out. Let's get into our questions. Snowblind5151 via YouTube says, when you disconnect a working component and your car bumbles, doesn't that mean the part was working right? If you disconnect a component in line with a bad component, would there be no change in the sound of the motor? So I understand the logic behind this question and it makes sense that if you have a component, for example, let's say a mass airflow sensor and you unplug that mass airflow sensor and the engine runs better. If it's running poorly, you unplug it, now it runs better. You think that, that it points to that component being uh, the issue. That's actually not the case. Uh, it may have been the case on older vehicles, uh, maybe early OBD2 stuff possibly, but even then, I don't think that was necessarily going to be the case. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, and this would, be, this would be true for whether it's talking about crank sensor, cam sensor, uh, oxygen sensor, mass airflow sensor, map sensor it could point to something, but it also could give you a false positive. And let me give you a, a really good example on a car that has a mass airflow sensor. If you have a car that has a vacuum leak, um, running rough because you have a vacuum leak, very common issue on any car that has a bunch of vacuum lines, uh, you know, a cracked pipe of some vacuum pipe of some kind would, would be very likely to cause a leak. If you had that and you unplug the mass airflow sensor, it would actually make the car run better. And the reason why is because the mass airflow sensor is sending unmetered air to, or when you have a vacuum leak, unmetered air is getting into the system. And when you unplug the mass airflow sensor, it's no longer metering that air. So it, it stables everything out. Um, that also depends on how bad the vacuum leak is, just to be clear, because if it's a massive vacuum leak, it's not going to get any better. Um, with that said, uh, that's generally not going to point towards anything you need. Uh, all current day vehicles are gonna require diagnostic to actually figure out what's going on with the car because when you unplug a sensor from an OBD2 car, the vehicle goes what's into what's called open loop. So what will happen is you unplug the mass airflow sensor, the car inputs a known good value for mass air because it no longer has that signal. So, so the engine doesn't immediately shut off, which if you have no signal from mass air, that could be the outcome. So it inputs a known good value for mass air, which is why the engine can continue to run with sensors unplugged. Um, there are some obviously exceptions to that, like a crank sensor probably will almost certainly cause your car to, to not run if you, if you unplug it. Um, but most of the other sensors in the vehicle actually will be able to run no problem. Um, so that, I completely understand why you might think that, but again, uh, I think oftentimes it will cause a, full, a false positive and may lead you down a path that may not be exactly what you need. Old Beater via Vortex says, what sorts of mods help my GTI stay planted during wide open throttle? I want to reduce the chances of wheel slip or the traction control light turning on and limit the power that gets to the wheels to prevent slip. I figure making sure all the components of the drivetrain and suspension are not broken is the first order of business. Also, high quality tires with lots of grip, but what else? Okay, so this question was from Vortex. It wasn't a Mark 7 group, just for context. You know, Mark 7's, a tuned Mark 7 is gonna break the tires loose uh, very easily in, in definitely first and second at least. Um, so your questions about what to do to plant the tires. A uh, couple things, obviously you mentioned making sure your suspension is good, which on a Mark 7, they're gonna be pretty much all pretty new cars, so that's unlikely. Um, yes, sticky tires are a no-brainer. Oftentimes, tires are very often overlooked for people who are looking to gain performance. Uh, they are a crucial part if you care about kind of traction with being a big one. Also, you have to understand that when you go into traction, if you want 
maximum attraction, you're going to be sacrificing longevity and vice versa. Have longevity, oftentimes you'll sacrifice uh, traction. Some tires are kind of the best of both worlds. There are some quality Michelin tires that are that kind of meet a crossover that's reasonable for both. Um, the next step, uh, the pendulum mount or dog bone mount, either an insert or a replacement would be a good option for you because that pendulum mount prevents wheel hop. Wheel hop is obviously, a, can create worse traction issues when you have your front wheels bouncing up and down while, while the wheels are spinning. You're not getting maximum traction under that circumstance. Um, turning your traction control off, that way it doesn't cut power real hard like that, uh, which is, I think what you're referring to is when you, when you wheels start to spin, it jacks back the power and then it, the whole car just bogs. Turn off traction control. Yes, you will get more spin, but you'll also get traction quicker and get going up quicker as opposed to the car bog, then kind of make the power. Um, the last one, this is kind of obvious, but also extremely expensive, would be a limited slip differential. Any car that doesn't have one, if you have a performance pack GTI and you have a the electronic limit slip, that, that's you know that's probably going to be the best you're going to get unless you really wanted to spend a ton of money. Uh, and and I covered a bunch of stuff about performance pack cars upgrading the limit slip recently in previous episodes of Ask Apps. So check out the past few episodes if you're interested in that subject. But outside of that, on just a regular manual, which would probably apply to most people. A limited slip is your best bet. It's gonna get you uh, traction the way you need to the best of the ability of that car is ever gonna have when you couple sticky tires, you know, and a limited slip differential. They are expensive. Uh, you know, limited slips are around 1100 bucks. And then, and if you can install it yourself, which I think is not a job for most people, that's great. If you can't, you're probably looking at another thousand dollars roughly in labor. Um, so you're talking about a two, two to $2,500 install and parts total, maybe a little bit more because there's a lot of hardware and stuff you have to buy with limited slips as well. So, um, that, those would be the best steps to take. And, uh, the, the limited slip would be at the top of the list, but it also is by far the most expensive. Mina via Facebook says, I was very tired the other night after a 16 hour shift and I accidentally left my gas cap off and went through the self car wash. How screwed am I? Okay, so I would say you probably don't need to worry too much. Uh, it's possible maybe you got some water and stuff in your gas tank. That's a maybe, you know, it probably, if anything, it would be a neg negligible amount. It's not great to run water into your gas tank, obviously, but uh, it, something that should be able to just burn through. That's probably even negligible because of, you know, the way the tank, the fuel door stuff works um, to get it in there in the first place. It's probably not going to allow tons of water in there. Um, and then the only real thing, and this is for anybody who's not in this circumstance, but just leaving your gas cap off in general, the only real concern with leaving your gas cap off is it's eventually going to set you a check engine light and it may have for you as well. Um, and all that's going to be is it's going to say that you have an EVAP leak or, uh, or EVAP large leak detected. Basically the evaporative emission system basically tests the gas tank to make sure that it, uh, is holding pressure properly and then it uses all that the fuel vapor to burn into the engine for emissions purposes. It, if that's the case, all you need to do is erase the check engine light with a scan tool like OBD11 or whatever. I'll link to it here where you can check that out if you're not familiar with that. But outside of that, you're not gonna cause any actual damage by leaving your gas cap off, but you will get a check engine light. So all you need to do is erase the faults the car will all be fine. There's, there's no damage done by leaving your gas cap off by itself. Bill via YouTube says, which would be better, take an 04 and a half GLI and swap a 24 valve VR6 six speed into it, or take an 04 GLI 24 valve VR6 six speed and swap the exterior and interior stuff to make it an 04 and a half GLI? Okay, so for me, I don't think this is even close as far as which one is is easier uh the interior is gonna be way easier uh they're both a considerable amount of work but swapping an engine from let's say from a 18t which you would find in a mark 4 gli that has a 18t in it that has the good interior which is why just for for reference the reason why he wants to do this is because he's looking to put a vr6 in in a car that has 
the better interior. GLI's had a really cool Recaro interior, which is you know appealing for pretty much anybody who's in, into cars. Um, and the 24 valve. The one thing I'll say is this: 24 valve engines. You know, VR6s are cool, but I'm not sure the work is even worth it. Uh, frankly, the amount of power you could put out of a 18T with a lot less work is probably considerably more than what you would expect to get from swapping a VR6 in. And the only scenario to me where I would say, you know, maybe you love VR6s and that's fine. Um, and in that, if that's the case, if you just love VR6s and you want to do that, I would put in the GLI interior and into that, the Recaro interior into that 24 valve car because that's a much, much easier uh, swap because all you're talking about is actual hard parts, putting them in there removing, installing, that type of stuff, as opposed to pulling an engine out, swapping it in, getting all the wiring done, trying to figure out all the wiring to make it work properly. That's a, that's a big headache um, for anybody who's ever tried to wire anything significantly. I've never done an engine swap wiring, but I know, you know, because I was a tech for a long time, I know what it takes to diagnose cars. I have a pretty good sense about what it would take to wire up an engine completely. And, and it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of tedious work. And some people may not even have the skill set for it. That's one. And even if you do, it's a, it's a long process that I don't think is going to be super easy in and out. Um, and for that reason alone, I think uh, it's probably not worth it to go down that road. Uh, with that said, the only time I think it would make sense would be is if you want to get big power and you were planning on building a 24 valve big turbo car. Um, but in that case, you'd almost want to have all wheel drive. So, you know, you may want to try to even go down the road of getting an R an R32 because that has already has a good interior and all that stuff as opposed to, you know, swapping all the stuff around. But, um, Hey, either way, I think obviously, uh, that I'm all for customizing it the way you want to, but definitely swapping the interior is either easier to me than doing an engine swap into a car that has a completely different engine from the factory. Thank you for watching episode 99 of the Ask Daft show where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave them in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like